This morning, our text, we return to Ephesians chapter 6. And as you are turning to Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll pick up where we left off last week, I'm going to read just briefly from our confession under effectual calling, that is, uh, the the gracious work of the Spirit of God in in regeneration. And this section in paragraph 3 deals with children or infants. Paragraph 3 of chapter 10 of our confession. Notice the language here. Elect infants dying in infancy are regenerated and saved by Christ through the Spirit who works when and where and how he pleases. So also are all the elect persons who are incapable of being outwardly called by the ministry of the word. And so there he addresses uh, infants or young children uh, or any uh, that might have disabilities where they're incapable of being outwardly called by the ministry of the word. All right, this morning our text is Ephesians chapter 6, and uh, we're going to focus primarily on the end of verse 3 where we left off last week and verse 4, but let's read through verses 1 through 4. Ephesians 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Verse 3, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Verse 4, now he He begins to address the fathers. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Our Father in God, we pray that you would bless the reading and exposition of your word. We pray for the activity and the work of your spirit. To work in young and old. To give us hearing of your word. It's truth and understanding of it that you would work in our hearts. You might effectually call us to saving faith, to take our hearts of stone and make them hearts of flesh. Help fathers to be the men they ought to be and wives, the women they ought to be in our homes and work savingly, we pray. Have mercy upon our homes and save our offspring, our children, we pray. Bless your word now, Father, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. We've been moving through chapter 5 and chapter 6, where Paul addresses the Christian family. And we have here, as we've been noticing along the way, in these, this series, this section, the later, the later half of this book of uh, application. We have... Uh, we might say, are the apostolic directives for the Christian home. If you remember, fathers, fathers are to love and lead. And then when this is rightly understood, we see that through this section, the great weight falls upon the husband as he leads his home, as he's the head of the household, as he is to love his wife and, and his home as Christ loves his church. And mothers are to submit and to revere and honor their husbands. And what we began to see last week as we moved into chapter 6, the children, the children are to obey and to honor their parents. Now listen closely. This is what we've noticed here. And and I highlighted, you remember the, the... The main imperatives that we've seen. Husbands are to love. Wives are to submit and honor. And children are to obey. And this, this is the God-ordained or biblical hierarchy or organization of the Christian home. And let us beware. And let us be wise. Let us be spiritually alert that our current cultural setting is pushing against this God-ordained order. In fact, they're not only pushing against it, 
They are striving to tear it down and to destroy it. This is especially noticeable in our current political climate. While neither party is overly family friendly, however, it is the left, it is the Democratic Party, it is the Marxist doctrines that have infiltrated into that party and its doctrines that are purposefully calculated and laboring to dismantle and to destroy the family hierarchy and the nuclear family. And they are unashamed to say it. With full force, their agenda is to promote the, um, to promote perverted views of the family, such as homosexuality, same-sex marriage, the killing of unborn children, and the touching upon this present passage, the removal of the leadership of the man or the husband over his house. This has happened at breakneck speed. To the degree that it's now odd or countercultural to read, to hear teaching on the biblical mandate for the family. But nevertheless, let us as Christian families, as a biblical church, let us fear God more than men. Let us stand upon the firm foundation of God's word. So let us this morning listen, let us learn, and let us live according to God's truth and word. So we continue this morning with the directives for the children, which are, if you will notice, as we get to verse 4, they're coupled with fatherly or parental responsibilities. Now, as a way of reminder, as a way of reminder or review, last week we began this section in chapter 6 dealing with the children of the home and to highlight the apostles' teaching and the way of the main thoughts, the imperatives or the commands of this section, if you remember, verse 1, children, obey your parents. And verse 2, children, honor your parents. So there is this command, the imperative to the children of the home. And then this morning, we will also move into verse 4 where we see the command or the responsibility of the father and we, when I speak of the father, we're going to see this doesn't negate the responsibility of parents collectively, that is, of the wife with her husband. But in a way of review, uh, verse 1, where we saw the command to the children, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. If you remember, the word obey there is an imperative. It's a strong command uh, from God, and we find this in the Old Testament, but it is a command from God to the children to obey their parents. And the apostle says, it's in the Lord. That is, this is a command from God. It is instructions according to his word, and it is right. It is right because God has said it's right. It is right because as image bearers of God, we know within the depths of our heart where the law of God is written, though it may be shattered, it is not absent. We know that it is right to obey our parents. Now this command, if you remember, I, I reminded parents last week that proper parenting is hard work. And there probably, there's probably no other aspect of church life and home life that is that others may look upon you with a critical eye than the behavior of your children and the way you rear your children. Unfortunately, that is the case. There's probably no place. That as you grow older, you will see your deficiencies as a mother or father concerning parenting. I've never heard a mother or father said, I think I did a pretty good job. Rarely do they say that. They say, I did my best, but I can see now areas that were lacking. I wish I could work in those areas. And, and we will find ourselves... Speaking, preaching to our own children concerning our grandchildren, those areas that we saw lacking in our own lives. But it is difficult. 
If you remember, I said, be persistent. Be patient. Be disciplined. As a Christian parent and in the rearing of your children in the home and teaching them the truth of God's word. And I mentioned especially in bringing them into the life of the church, especially the worship service. It is hard, but our children over time will grow in discipline. They will mature and they will learn to sit still over time. And by God's grace and through the work of the Spirit, they will hear His law and His gospel. And in God's kindness and special grace and His saving grace, He might come near to them in work and mind and heart and save them. But it's here in the gathered assembly, if you remember, where our elders, where we should be constantly exhorting our parents, reminding you to bring, to be here with us as parents, but to bring your children into the assembly of God's people, here where Jesus is found, here where there is the promise of God's presence, that as we worship God and they, they, they see this, they perceive this, they hear the word of God being sung, they hear the word of God through prayer, they hear the, the spirit-empowered word read and preached, and they see the spirit-empowered word in the sacraments or the ordinance of the Lord's Supper and baptism. Your children, remember, your children need Jesus Christ savingly. As I mentioned, your little boy, your teenage son, your little girl, your teenage daughter need the blood of Jesus Christ applied to their souls or they will eternally perish. Now, again, the command that we came to last week was there was a twofold aspect of it. The command from God to the children is to obey in verse 1 and to honor in verse 2 of our text. God's word calls the children of the church to obedience to their parents. Children, obey your parents. Now, the family structure of the Old Testament still holds into the new. There is a difference. There is a theological shift that will take place covenantally concerning that. But the idea that God will primarily work through families still holds. God often will work savingly through a household. He'll convert a wife and then later the husband. And then years later, as they faithfully raise their children in the church, you'll see salvation come to that household, maybe even in its fullness. But children are to obey their parents. Listen, children, when you do not obey mom and dad, you sin against mom and dad. You sin against God. And no one's happy. God's not happy. Your parents aren't happy. It is sin. And you need forgiveness. That comes only in Christ. The children, if you remember, when they obey the Lord, when we see this language here, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. When the child obeys the parent, he, he obeys the Lord. It's pleasing to God. When he rebels against the parent, he or she is rebelling against God. If you remember, Paul echoes this same uh, teaching over in Colossians. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 20. Children, obey your parents, he says, in all things. And then he says this. For this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And so we saw that commandment to obey. And the command to honor, in verse 2, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. This is, the, this is the fifth commandment in the New Testament. Again, uh, it, we find, I mean, in the, New, in the uh, Ten Commandments. This is the fifth commandment in the Ten Commandments. And this was foundational for the nation, of the Hebrew nation, for the family would be the cornerstone as it is of any nation. 
And they knew that if the family begins to crumble apart, if husbands were not what they ought to be and wives not what they ought to be, and if you had children that were rebellious, things would begin to come apart. And so there's this, this is found early on in the formation of the Hebrew nation, that is Israel. The children were to obey and to honor. And here we see this again as the fifth commandment in the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20, verse 12, as we read this morning, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. And the word honor there means to value something, to revere something. That is, you are to honor your parents, you are to revere your parents. And this honor will manifest itself in obedience. For the honor carries the thought of attitude toward parents. So remember that, children. Obey your parents. Honor your father and mother. Now, we stopped right there. And at the end of verse 3, there was this word of blessing. Or we might even call it a word of motivation, maybe. But it was the blessing of God. He said that, Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with promise. And what is the promise? Verse 3. That it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Now under the Old Covenant and in the Old Testament, the word land is used there. It, the thought is the land that was promised to Abraham and his physical offspring and descendants. The land there. The land of Israel. Under the Old Covenant, there was the blessing of long life, as we see there in Exodus 20, verse 12. And Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16, Deuteronomy 5, verse 16 says, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. Now, how might we understand this as Paul is using it in the New Testament? Because no longer is it the word land. He begins to shift with a word in the New Testament with world or earth. So, so what, is, what is happening here? And how might we understand this and its application to us and for our children? Well, let me say this. One, the immediate context was under the Old Covenant and the land promised to the Jewish people. And under that covenant, God made with the Hebrew nation in which obedience to the law would bring temporal blessings. And we can name many. You can see these in Deuteronomy. But for instance, victory over their enemies, temporal prosperity of many different sorts, and occupation of the land. And occupation of the land seems to be the main thought here. That land that they occupied, we need to understood in the New Testament, was typological of heaven, new heavens, new earth. That which was Eden, that which was Canaan, would ultimately be in the presence of God one day. That place. But let me move on. Number two. In the New Testament, again, this language changes from land to world, especially as when, or from uh, speaking of that particular land of Canaan to the world or to the earth, especially as when it's tied to the obedience of the faith, that is faith in Christ and the gospel, uh, as such as we'll see and such you'll see like in the, at the end of Romans, in Romans chapter 16. But it's tied to the obedience of the faith, that is faith in Christ, the gospel, we see this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Or in Revelation 21, new heavens and new earth is that which the people of God are promised and they will inherit through Jesus Christ their Lord. The promise of this new creation and the full and eternal inheritance that comes with being spiritually united to Christ and to being an offspring of Christ, being born from above, the seed of Christ and his child, that is now, by being in the last Adam, the firstborn son who will inherit all things. It's the same language found in chapter 1 of Ephesians 
chapter 1 and verse 20 where it says, Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand above uh, his right hand in the heavenly places. Verse 21, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. It's the same language of Matthew 28, verse 18, where Jesus spoke concerning the Great Commission. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So it is Christ Christ, the risen Lord. Christ as the last Adam. Christ as the firstborn from the dead. All who are united to him, all who are the offspring of Christ, shall be partakers of the eternal inheritance that is to come that we will receive, as you read about, like in Revelation 21. New heavens, new earth. That's why we are now new creatures or new creations in Christ Jesus. And third option, I think we should lean into what I just said, understanding the past and the old covenant, lean into Paul's eschatological understanding of that to come and what we have in Christ. And then I think Charles Hodge, number three, makes an important point and very simple. Charles Hodge points out that this promise Like all such promises, he says, quote, is a revelation of a general purpose of God. And it makes known what will be the usual course of his providence. Obedient children, as a general rule, are prosperous and happy. The general promise is fulfilled to individuals just so far as it shall serve for God's glory and for their good. End quote. If you know anything about fatherless households, if you know anything about the life of rebellious children, you know what Charles Hodge is saying is true. So, there's where we left off. Now, this morning, we're moving into verse 4. There was the command to children, obey and honor. And there's a promise there. Now the command, our responsibility of the Father, and you might say slash, as I have in my notes, parents. Verse 4, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So we see here in verse 4, there is a shift from the duty of the children to that of the parents, in particular, especially the father. The command or the responsibility of the father is the primary thought here. And this, we might say, is God's wisdom for parents. And again, especially what is in light here, the father. The apostles addressing the fathers of the churches. The father is the head of the household. The scripture tells us that he, the father, is to rule his household well. This is seen especially in the mandate or requirements for an elder. In 2 Timothy 3, 4, who is to be set aside as an elder? One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. But, let's be clear, it's not as though the mother is of no concern here. Verse 4. Parents, father and mother should both walk in this command. It's not as if fathers are commanded to provoke the not to provoke the children to wrath, but it's okay for the mother to provoke her children to wrath. Right? No mother, no mother should listen very closely to this command and kick it aside to the curb, right? She should hear this too. But Paul is addressing the head of the household, the father, whose responsibility is oversight over the entire household, his family. Now, the mother's authority, the mother has authority and she's responsible, but it's subordinate to her husband. But she has responsibility. Responsibility. 
and she has authority. And it is over her children that she is subordinate to her husband. So it appears that Paul's just beginning at the top of the hierarchy, as we might say. That's not a good word nowadays, is it, hierarchy? The husband's the top of the hierarchy. Now pay attention, parents, and notice that the scriptures are very clear. Listen, very clear that you play a fundamental role in the spiritual development and growth of your children. Verse 4. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Notice, first of all, he tells the fathers in a negative way. Do not. Do not. This is the negative side of the command. Do not provoke your children. This is an action. Listen, men. Listen. We've all done this at one time or another especially in disciplining our children, are giving a, an overly strict command in our household. Listen, husbands, this is an action for us to be wise and discerning and to avoid. This is an action to avoid. Do not provoke your children to wrath. We are to avoid all, all deliberate forms or actions that, and think of the words that, this word can mean, you see it in some of your translations, that would provoke our children, exasperate our children, that would frustrate our children, or they would move the child to wrath or anger, as we might say. Again, the parallel passage to this is Paul writing to the Colossians. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, Colossians 3, verse 21, fathers do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Now, we've all observed, we've all experienced or heard about parents, our fathers, that were excessive, especially in the way of their authority in the home. They were harsh. God's word is calling upon us as fathers to not provoke or to inflame our children to wrath. We are not, as fathers, to be unjust or overly strict or severe in our discipline. When I speak of discipline, I'm not only speaking of punishment for wrong actions, but this word also, the idea of discipline, can speak of the orderliness of the house, the household. We've all walked into homes, good Christian parents. But often the father led that home. You thought when you walked in, the children were like in the marine barracks, right? We've seen that. That's not good. It's not good. This authority of the parent is for the child's good. It's not for the parent's own self-gratification. Listen, parents, we should not be parents implementing needless and unreasonable demands or restrictions upon our children. And we should not be punishing them too severely. Remember, we too must stand for the judgment seat of our God. And we'll give an account for the stewardship of our children and of our upbringing of them. And we have to be discerning about this. 
His daughters will be different from boys. And different boys will be different from other boys. And girls from different girls. You, you know what I'm talking about. Our children are different and different personalities. And the way that we will discipline them and the greater or, 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 or the less amount will depend on them. I can think of myself and my, my, my younger brother. He still to this day has a little grudge about the way that my father would discipline us. I, on the other hand, just said, was what it was. That was bad. You just pressed through it. But there was a difference there, apparently. Him being a younger brother, he struggled with it more. And maybe there were times when the weight was greater on him and I, and I didn't know about it. But children will differ. And the way that they're disciplined will often be different. But let us be careful not to lay down a standard that no child can keep and frustrate the child and turn that child in such a way that it will move him away from the Christian faith where he wants nothing to do because he thinks this is Christianity. And it moves him away from the faith. It, it moves him away from holy living. Let it not be that. Again, Colossians 3.21, Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. But then positively, if that's the command that we should labor against, to not provoke them to anger or wrath, positively, he says this, verse 4, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. So there is discipline. There is instruction. And it is sure. And it is to be strong. It comes from God. This action that we see here, is to be, while well, that's to be avoided, and sometimes we have to discern between that and the differences in our children, but we don't want to provoke them to frustration. But here, again, as we labor in our homes as fathers, this is an action that is to be pursued. It is an action that is to be uh, accomplished. And this has to do with the development and the growth of our children. Again, verse 4, notice what he says, but bring them up, and then he uses this word, in the training. Some of your translations have the word training, nurture, or discipline. It, it, it bring up, it carries the idea of development. Training, uh, it, the training is the thought, this is, a, this is the thought of education, by the way. Uh, again, notice verse 4. In the training, and he says, then, an admonition of the Lord. Or some of your Bibles will say, instruction of the Lord. And that carries the idea of teaching truth. But also it has the idea of correction. I mean, for instance, listen to 2 Timothy 3.16. For the same word for instruction found here is found over in 2 Timothy. The same word. But the main thought is that the child is nurtured and instructed by God through the parents. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verse 14. Listen to this. But you must continue, Paul writing to Timothy, but you must continue in these things, notice this, which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now watch what Paul does here. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Here he goes. For reproof, for correction, for instruction. There's the word. And notice these other words around instruction. Correction, reproof. He says for instruction in righteousness. And though while he applies this to Timothy as a minister of the gospel, the implication of it is for all the people of God, isn't it? For that the man of God may be complete. In this case, we would use the word of God. We would teach the word of God. We would instruct the word of God that our children might be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work as they would grow and mature in Christ Jesus. So, the father is to avoid... Provoking his child to wrath. He is to positively 
train, nurture, discipline his child. And he is to raise them in this admonition or instruction of the Lord. All right, let me give you some application. And then we'll wind down from here. Some application concerning this. First of all, when we say uh, child rearing, I grew up in the part of the South where I was told, at least at that time, we say now raising our children. When I was in elementary school, the teacher would say, uh, you raise hogs, you rear children. You guys know what I mean. John Gill, that old particular Baptist, John Gill, concerning this verse, listen what he says here. This is very good. John Gill says, quote, Fathers are particularly mentioned, they being the heads of families, and are apt to, to be too severe. He even says it. So hundreds of years ago, he's saying, these fathers, sometimes fathers are apt to be too severe. As mothers, he says, can be too indulgent. Everybody in this room knows that's true, right? The Gill says, but bring them up. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Instructing them, he says, in the knowledge of divine things. Setting them good examples. Taking care to prevent their falling into bad company. Praying with them and for them bringing them into the house of God under the means of grace to attend public worship, end quote. That's, there's my sermon for the last two weeks. So let me say this. As we set forth last week, listen, fathers and mothers, we're on the same team. The mother and father are working and laboring to the same end that the father must be leading. Make it a priority to have your children on the Lord's Day in church. Teach them the rhythm of the weekly Lord's Day in worship. Where as Saturday night arrives, your children will be going, Mama, Daddy, tomorrow's church. Isn't tomorrow church? And if something happens and we have a foot of snow and some reason we can't have church, they go, we're not going to church. And the children seem alarmed by it. Let that become part of the rhythm of life in your home. That is of the weekly Lord's Day in worship. But remember, be persistent, be patient, be disciplined. But they will grow into being uh, accustomed to the, in the worship of the church. Now, if you, I was asked, somebody emailed me this week about a, a book. What would be a good book uh, pertaining to this? A good book... On parenting, and I don't necessarily endorse everything. It's small. It's not a large book at all. About 60 pages. It's a little pamphlet almost. A good book on parenting uh, children in the faith and you as a parent is J.C. Ryle's The Duties of Parents. The Duties of Parents by J.C. Ryle. J.C. Ryle says this, quote, Train them to habits of diligence and regularly about public means of grace. Tell them of the duty and privileges of going to the house of grace. Tell them of the duty, I mean, to the house of God and joining in the prayers of the congregation. Tell them that wherever the Lord's people are gathered together, there the Lord Jesus is present and in a special manner. And that those who absent themselves must expect, like the Apostle Thomas, to miss a blessing. Tell them of the importance of hearing the word preached and that it is God's ordinance for converting, sanctifying, and building up the souls of men. Tell them how the Apostle Paul enjoys us, enjoins us not to forsake the assembling in ourselves together as a matter of some is, Hebrews 10.25, but exhort one another to stir one another up and so much the more as we see the day approaching. So let us do that. Remember, your children need Jesus savingly. Your little boy, your little girl, are by birth, by procreation. They are in Adam. More on that in a moment. But Christ has promised to be present with his assembled people. It is there. <clears throat> 
and the assembled congregation of the special presence of Christ that he will speak through his word and make himself known in his promises in the sacraments. So the children of Christian parents, the children of a believing mother, a believing father, or both, by all means labor to have them in the church. Next, the way of application. Fathers and mothers, you are to labor together Labor together for the souls of your children. Again, listen to Paul. There's things we can look at in, in, the, in the Old Testament, but listen to Paul in the New Testament. As he's writing to Timothy, first of all, he says in 1 Timothy 4.16. Here's a verse that we don't think about. This, this is the key, one of the key verses for ministry. But not only for the minister and for the life of the church, but also for us as parents in our homes. 1 Timothy 4.16, take heed to yourself, the way that you live, and to the doctrine, to teaching. So take heed, be alert, be wise, be biblical about how you are living before your children, and for the instruction, the teaching, the doctrine. And then Paul says, continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. You hear that? In 2 Timothy, Paul says next. Now listen to this. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 3, Paul says this. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as did my forefathers did, as without ceasing. I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. Now he's writing to Timothy, and then listen to what he says next, verse 5. What I call to remembrance, the genuine faith that is in you. There's a genuine faith in you, Timothy. And then Paul says this, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois. And your mother, Eunice. And I'm persuaded it's in you also. Okay. So Paul says, your grandmother and mother are Christians. And there is a genuine faith in them. And Timothy, I see it in you. I'm convinced it's in you. And when you pick that up and you realize that's in 2 Timothy 1 and 2 Timothy 3... When Paul says, but you continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Now, who was teaching, the, who was teaching him, him the Scriptures from childhood? His mother and grandmother. Did you catch the link? They're teaching him from childhood. You have known the Holy Scriptures and then Paul says, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So mothers, homeschool mothers, all that are laboring to teach their children the instruction of the, of the Lord. Be encouraged. God's word is able to make your children wise for salvation. And your labors are not in vain. And then next. Our children in the church. All right, this is brief. Oh, there's, there's so much here that could be discussed and taught on, but just listen. Within our own Reformed tradition, it is well known there's a diversity of views concerning children and their relationship to the covenant community, that, that is the church. And there are different practices that churches have done. But let me say this. Some of you may say or be considering or thinking. So what is the status of our children? Are they covenant children? As a particular Baptist and holds to the doctrine that's found in our confession, I would say 
Yes, they are covenant children. But you say, what covenant are you talking about, Pastor? The covenant of works in Adam. By physical birth, they have been brought into this world. And there they are. Unless there is a special work of grace. They are in the covenant of works. They are in Adam. By birth, they are brought into that covenant. Oh. But they're not in Christ by physical birth. It must be new birth. Spiritual rebirth. Right? And you're not in Adam... And in Christ at the same time. There's not, there's not this gray area, right? I'm, I'm not condemned to my sins and then on my way to heaven at the same time, right? I'm either in Adam or in Christ. In Adam, all die. All in Christ, what? All made alive. So let's remember that. So what is then with this? Paul writing to the children in the church, he assumes that, yes, he assumes that there are these families they have gathered together. There might be believing moms that are converted. They have their children there. There might be believing mothers and fathers or a believing father who has his children. And they are bringing their children into the life of the church. So how are we to see our children then? The way that as I've thought through this through the years, I see the children of Christians as they well in the language of Paul as we bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord our children they live listen closely in the shadow of the covenant community they walk they grow up in our midst, do they not? Imagine in your mind a giant oak tree. A giant oak tree. I guess to be biblical, it'd be an olive tree, wouldn't it? And it's casting a shadow, it's full leaf over its side. And underneath it, Stands a child next to the oak tree. The child's not the oak tree, but he stands in the shadow of it. And while our children are with us, walking in our homes and in the life of the church, let us make the most of this time as parents and as a church. Because our children live in the shadow of the covenant community, our children do have great and mighty privileges and advantages. They are regularly worshiping in the presence of God that is as much as one whose heart is stone is there in the presence of God. They are there being exposed to the word of God. And the ordinances, that is the sacraments. So let us, one, instruct them with God's word in the church and at home. Let us pray for the conversion of their souls as father and mother and grandparents. Let us pray for them corporately. Let us be mindful that God will work through households, it is not unusual to see God graciously work through a husband and, a, and then a mother and then th their children come to saving faith in Christ. That is not unusual. God does work through households. However, God is sovereign. And he reminds us of that, of the sovereignty of his, dis of his distinguishing grace and that we will not bind him or bend his will because within that same home, just as there's an Isaac, there might be an Ishmael. Just as there is a Jacob, there might be a what? An Esau. 
He tells us this in his word. He reminds us, I am God. I have mercy on whom I have mercy. Let us never think that by something that we have done, that somehow we have bent the arm of God to save our children. Whether it's through faithfulness in homeschooling, faithfulness in home life, and the list can go on. Let us cry out to God and know that we are to be faithful in those means, but yet we cry out to God, Father, if they are to know you, to fear you, to love you, you alone can take their heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh. You alone can quicken their dead spirit and make it alive in Christ where they might have faith and trust in you. You alone can give understanding of these things. Have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon my children and save them. Let us be careful. Again, in that same context, some would desire to rush their children to the font. Others in evangelical obedience will be encouraging and striving and sometimes pushing their children to make some kind of quote-unquote decision. And decisions are important, don't get me wrong. But we want to make sure it's faith in Christ. And the elders have to wrestle with that. And it's when a parent comes up with the best of intentions. Here's Susie, she wants to be baptized. Yeah. She, she's made a profession of faith in Christ and you talk to her and she's, she's five and you find out she, she really doesn't even understand what the gospel is. Let's be careful. Let's labor at the end that they grasp these things. Let's raise our children in the faith. And let's remember this. Listen, Reformed people. This is one of the things that can be deadly about our practice. Let us be mindful that as we are training our children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, as we are instructing them in these things, let us understand that it's not just imparting biblical and doctrine, doctrinal information as though, as though just the information itself, reciting the catechism by itself, is conversion. It's not. Though, though, it's not less. It's not less than that. They, those who believe in his name, those that have saving faith, there is what the reformers called no tie. That is, there is data. There's information that is to be there. So the information needs to be there. They need to understand 1 Corinthians 15 and the understanding of what the gospel is. But has the Spirit of God taken that information of the gospel and used it to the quickening of their soul and to bring eternal life? They must be twice born, born once to us as parents and born a second time, born again from, a, from above by the Spirit of God, from, from the Father above. They must be born twice. As Paul would say, or not Paul, but John, John would say, but as many as received him, John 1.12, to them he gave the authority, the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Verse 13. Who were born not of blood. Nor the will of flesh. Nor the will of man. But of God. And that is the desire of our hearts. That, or at least it should be for our children. That they would be born of God. From above. Let us this morning. As we are mindful of these things. And of the words of the apostles. Again, we've heard the instruction of what we are not to do and what we are to do as parents and as children. But let us be mindful that it is the gospel that saves. As Paul reminded us in chapter 5, where he, in a way of analogies, as he set the beloved the father for the wife, or the husband for the wife, he set forth the gospel. In Ephesians 5, verse 25. It was just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her by the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having any spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that she should be holy and without blemish. It is there we turn to the blood of Christ, the word of the gospel. 
that we find salvation. So our young people, whether you're 7 or 17 or 27, turn from your sins, your disobedience. Confess that to your parents if you have been disobedient to them. Confess it to God. And turn to Christ and the gospel. He who died for your sins and gives eternal life. And fathers, as we think of our shortcomings and being obedient to these commands, let us confess it to God. Father, I have not done everything I ought to have done. And I'm growing ever aware of that. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me. And flee to Christ where there is forgiveness in his blood.